Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. Today we are continuing in the book of Judges and we will be going into Judges 13. So here the story of Samson begins in the book of Judges. Actually the story of Samson um, is contained in Judges 13 all the way to 16. But today I want to just focus on Judges 13, actually not necessarily about Samson specifically, but about his father's question to the angel of the Lord about Samson's rule of life. So let's get into the reading. We will be reading Judges 13 together. The birth of Samson. Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, so the Lord delivered them into the hands of the Philistines for 40 years. A certain man of Zorah named Manoah from the clan of the Danites had a wife who was childless, unable to give birth. The angel of the Lord appeared to her and said, You are barren and childless, but you are going to become pregnant and give birth to a son. Now see to it that you, you drink no wine or other fermented drink and that you do not eat anything unclean. You will become pregnant and have a son whose head is never to be touched by a razor because the boy is to be a Nazarite dedicated to God from the womb. He will take the lead in delivering Israel from the hands of the Philistines. Then the woman went to her husband and told him, a man of God came to me. He looked like an angel of God. Very awesome. I didn't ask him where he came from, and he didn't tell me his name. But he said to me, You will become pregnant and have a son. Now then, drink no wine or other fermented drink, and do not eat anything unclean, because the boy will be a Nazarite of God from the womb until the day of his death. Then Manoah prayed to the Lord, Pardon your servant, Lord, I beg you to let the man of God you sent to us come again to teach us how to bring up the boy who is to be born. God heard Manoah, and the angel of the Lord came again to the woman while she was out in the field. But her husband Manoah was not with her. The woman hurried to tell her husband, He's here, the man who appeared to me the other day. Manoah got up and followed his wife. When he came to the man, he said, Are you the man who talked to my wife? I am, he said. So Manoah asked him, When your words are fulfilled, what is to be the rule that governs the boy's life and work? The angel of the Lord answered, Your wife must do all that I have told her. She must not eat anything that comes from the grapevine, nor drink any wine or other fermented to drink, nor eat anything unclean. She must do everything I have commanded her. Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, We would like you to stay until we prepare a young goat for you. The angel of the Lord replied, Even though you detain me, I will not eat any of your food. But if you prepare a burnt offering, but if you prepare a burnt offering, offer it to the Lord. Manoah did not realize that it was the angel of the Lord. Then Manoah inquired of the angel of the Lord, What is your name? So that we may honor you when your words come true. He replied, Why do you ask my name? It is beyond understanding. Then Manoah took a young goat together with the grain offering and sacrificed it on a rock to the Lord. And the Lord did an amazing thing while Manoah and his wife watched. As the flame blazed up from the altar toward heaven, the angel of the Lord ascended in the flame. Seeing this, Manoah and his wife fell with their faces to the ground. When the angel of the Lord did not show himself again to Manoah and his wife, Manoah realized that it was the angel of the Lord. We are doomed to die, he said to his wife. We have seen God. But his wife answered, If the Lord had meant to kill us, he would have not accepted a burnt offering and a grain offering from our hands, nor shown us. All these things are now told us this. The woman gave birth to a boy and named him Samson. He grew and the Lord blessed him. And the spirit of the Lord began to stir him while he was in Mahane Dan between Sora and Eshtal. What are some observations from this story? Now, number one, Samson was to be a Nazarite of God. So, God has called Naz uh, God had called Samson to become a Nazarite all the way from the womb until the day of his death. His father's name was Manoah. He was a Danite from Zora. This is about 22 and a half kilometers from Jerusalem. And the angel of the Lord had appeared to Samson's mother, who was at the time barren. 
So this lifetime vow is actually unusual and we'll see in a little bit about what that what it means to take a Nazarite vow. For Samson to have to take <clears throat> this vow from the womb, it meant that his mom had to also take the vow while Samson was in her womb because she would not be able to drink anything that's um, alcoholic, anything from the grapevine. In Numbers 6 verses 1 to 21, we see here the details of what the vow of the Nazarite entails. So let's read verses 1 to 21 from number 6. Then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When either a man or woman consecrates an offering to take the vow of a Nazarite, to separate himself to the Lord, he shall separate himself from the wine and similar drink. He shall drink neither vinegar made from wine nor vinegar made from similar drink. Neither shall he drink any grape juice, nor eat fresh grapes or raisins. All the days of his separation, he shall eat nothing that is produced by the grapevine, from seed to skin. All the days of the vow of his separation, no razor shall, shall come upon his head, until the days are fulfilled for which he separated himself to the Lord. He shall be holy. Then he shall let the locks of his hair of his head grow. All the days that he separates himself to the Lord, he shall not go near a dead body. He shall not make himself unclean even for his father or his mother, for his brother or his sister, when they die because of his separation to God is on his head. So we see here five features of the Nazarite vow. Number one is voluntary. Two, it can be done by either men or women. Three, it has a specific time frame. Four, there are specific requirements and restrictions. And five, at its conclusion, a sacrifice is offered. So because the angel of the Lord said that Samson has to take this vow from the womb, his mom took part in this vow as well. The purpose of taking this vow is to be set apart and receive power from God for a special service. And we'll see in Samson's story that he did receive amazing power from God and God did use him for a very special purpose. So that was observation number one. Now observation number two, Manoah, Samson's father, got this news that his wife who was barren will now bear a son. And he was also interested. He wanted to take responsibility for this child that God was going to give to them. He inquired of the Lord about the rule of Samson's life and work. He wanted to know, how do we raise this child? Verse 12 says, So Manoah asked him, When your words are fulfilled, what is to be the rule that governs the boy's life and work? So Manoah wasn't just interested in having the son and in just like raising him under his own wisdom, but he really wanted to know, you're giving this boy to us for a purpose. How are we going to raise him? So in this video, I actually want to talk about that, really focus on the principles of living, the biblical principles for us to live out our lives as disciples of Christ. Do you have a rule of life? Do you have biblical principles that you intentionally know that you're living based on? Um, so the rule of life, there is a really great article, a piece of writing by Pastor Henry Venn, who was a pastor in the 1700s. I'll link it below, which is really a good read to really understand what it means to lead a Christian life. The, the title of this article is called Directions for Leading a Christian Life. And that involves various things, prayer, Bible study, public worship, listening to sermons, being in community, and also spending time alone with God. So those were the two observations. Number one, Samson was called for a lifetime Nazarite vow. And secondly, his father Manoah asked the Lord, what should be the rule of Samson's life and work. So what are some applications from this story? Number one, when we have rules of life, we can make decisions based on principles, not based on preferences. When we have a rule of life, we can make decisions based on principles and not preferences. Our guiding principles, what our rules of life are, will direct us to either be more like Christ or less like Christ in our character. And when we make, we decide on living out our principles based on God's word, we will naturally be more like Christ in our character. 
So do you make decisions based on principles or do you make decisions based on your preferences? The thing is that principles do not change over time, even though situations may change, but if you make decisions based on firm, tested, God-honoring principles, your principles will not change, but your preferences will change based on your circumstance, your situations, the people in your life, the temptations in front of you. So when we're making decisions based on our preferences, that does not guarantee that our decisions will be more Christ-like. I had just actually recently heard a sermon by Dr. Charles Stanley on decision making and he makes this really important distinction between principles and preferences. I'll link it below. I highly recommend you to watch that. So what are our principles? Do we live by principles as disciples of Christ or do we just make decisions when situations come up based on our preferences? And having good principles to make decisions from really does give us this strong footing and a firm foundation to live. So we can actually make difficult decisions ahead of time. We can avoid making rash decisions. We can avoid making decisions based on temptations. And we will know what we want to say no to. We will know ahead of time what we want to say yes to, right? I'll share a little bit about some of the examples that I the principles that I live on and I make decisions ahead of time because of these principles. And so these principles, when you make decisions ahead of time, they do protect us to a certain extent from temptations and from peer pressure, pressure from society and pressures from your life. I know the Bible is filled with biblical principles. God really has given us all we need to live a life that can honor him. For example, a very obvious example of biblical principles are the Ten Commandments, right? In Exodus 20 and Deuteronomy 5, you know, God says to have no other gods before him, not to worship idols, not to take the name of the Lord in vain, remembering the Sabbath day, having our spiritual rest in Christ, and also physical rest is important, honoring our father and our mother, not to murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, don't give false testimony, don't covet or desire your neighbor's goods, his house or his wife. So these are very important commandments to live by. Now the idea is not to be legalistic because we know that we cannot perfectly fulfill all these commands. We can never perfectly live out these principles and that's why we need Jesus. Jesus fulfills these commands. But does it mean that we just throw it away and not care about any of these commandments and guidelines? No, we have to depend on God to help us live that out to the best of our ability under God's empowerment and under God's emboldenment to help us live this out. Now, what are some of the principles that I personally try to live out to the best of my ability and under the guidance and under the power of the Spirit? Firstly, Micah 6, 8 is to live just, to act justly, to love mercy and walk humbly with my God. Um, secondly, to value relationship, relationships and community in Christ. Hebrews 10, 24, 25 tells us, and let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some of us are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. So this is a really important principle for me and my family as disciples of Christ to value community, to value relationships in the family of Christ. So how does this look like? What does this look like in everyday life? This is to make a decision and have time that we will as much as possible go to life group, attend life group gatherings, attend our church services because community is really important. So when we make that decision ahead of time, even when on Fridays we have our life group meetings, we may feel tired, we may feel like, oh, it's a long, it's been a long week and we have all these reasons we justify in our minds why we should stay home and relax and not go to life group. But because we made that decision ahead of time, we don't have to argue with ourselves. We don't have to negotiate with ourselves with our preferences because we're living, we're making that decision based on the principle that we do not give up meeting together. And you know, every time we make that decision to go, 
we get into life group, we get in community, we get refreshed, we either have conversations, we pray together. We're always, always refreshed. So we never regret the decision to go to life group. And now there are times when we real, really can't go. There are things that do come up. That's not what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about when the temptation to be alone, to stay home alone can be so strong and the enemy will actually help you justify why you should stay home. Those are the times when you need to live out the principle of not giving up meeting together with the body of Christ. Another principle I try to live by is to be obedient in my generosity to others, to the glory of God. 2 Corinthians 9 verses 10 to 15 says, Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. This service that you perform is not only supplying the need of the Lord's people, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Because of the service by which you have proved yourselves, others will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. And in their prayers for you, their hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing grace God has given you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Praise God. And then Proverbs 3.27 is a great reminder when I am struggling whether I should give or not and when it's in my power to give, should I give? I stand on the principle that do not withhold good from those to whom it is due when it is in your power to act. Do not say to your neighbor, come back tomorrow and I'll give it, give it to you when you already have it with you. So if it's in your power to act, your neighbor has a need, then act. It's that simple. Next principle is to feed my mind, thought, and my heart with lovely things. Philippians 4 verses 8 to 9 says, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is anything excellence, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. So that makes a decision in my mind before I actually have to face a decision. Do I watch something? Do I read something? Do I partake in an activity? Is it honoring to God? Is it lovely? Is it excellent? Is it worthy of praise? If I can't praise God after I watch something or while I'm watching something, if I can't praise God when I'm doing a certain activity, then I won't do it. See, so I make that decision ahead of time. Next principle, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We make our decision now about our allegiance to Christ before we're even offered any other allegiance. We don't have to have a conversation. We don't have to have a negotiation. We don't have to have a back and forth compromise whether we should give our allegiance to another God at all because the decision has been done. Full stop. It's done. The decision has been made that for me and my house, our allegiance is to God, is to Jesus Christ alone. So that was the first application. Make our decisions based on principles and not on preferences. Second application is that when we live by principles, we will be more likely to respond instead of reacting to negative situations and challenges. When situations come up, when we are either wrong, when we feel cheated, we are tempted to re react in anger or react in a rash way, in a way that we may regret. But when we live on principles, we will actually respond and not react. We won't react in anger, but we are actually positioned when we make these decisions that have ahead of time, we will be positioned to respond in love and wisdom. So when people wrong us, they cheat us, whether it's about business, whether it's a personal issue, we are able to make that decision to forgive. We make the decision to forgive, even though it doesn't mean we are reconciling to them, it doesn't mean that we need to continue 
to partake in that relationship, be a part of that relationship to the extent, to the level that it had been before the incident, it means that we release ourselves. We take that hook out of ourselves and free ourselves from investing any more energy or emotion in that drama, in that unforgiveness. And so the decision made ahead of time when people heard us, we are going to forgive, actually helps us live a more principled life, helps us live in response versus living based on reacting to things that happen to us. I hope that makes sense, but it is a decision that's not easy for sure, but you can make these decisions ahead of time. When people hurt us, I will make a decision to forgive them. Even though they don't say sorry, even though they don't make reconciliation, I decide to forgive just because it's healthier for me and I can move forward. Why would I waste my time and energy and let the enemy continue to steal my joy from that relationship? Now, third application, when we are more Christ-like as we live out our rules of life, we will naturally point people to Jesus. We live in freedom. We live in this abundant life that Jesus has for us. We don't keep ourselves paralyzed in unforgiveness. We don't keep ourselves paralyzed in hate or malice or all the negative stuff that is just hindering us. It's hindering our prayer lives. It's hindering our relationships. When we release ourselves from these things, we will be more Christ-like and people will see a difference and we will naturally point people to Jesus. We will truly be set apart and people will definitely see there is something different about us. I, I love this quote that says that, you know, you can't change the world if you are exactly like it. You can't change the world if you are exactly like it. And that's why when we look at the Old Testament stories about how God wanted to set the Israelites apart, he wanted to consecrate them, make them holy because he had the most special, unique purpose of bringing out our Messiah, our Savior, Jesus Christ from the lineage of the Israelites. So they had to be physically set apart. They had rules and commands they needed to obey to be physically and spiritually set apart from the rest of the nations around them. Now, because we are in Christ, we are already set apart. We have the Holy Spirit in us. We have Him guiding us, teaching us, comforting us, and keeping us in His ways. And even though we try our best, even when we try our best to obey the Holy Spirit's prompting, trying our best to obey God's word, we may still miss the mark because we are still in the struggle between our flesh as well. But thank God there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And the amazing thing is we don't discard the commands that God gives us. We don't discard the word that God has given us, has gifted to us. We have God's word and his biblical principles and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit to help us define for ourselves what are the rules of life? What are some biblical principles that we can decide and write down, make a decision today to write down, to adhere to personally, not out of fear, but out of love for God and for his people. So take some time and list out some biblical principles as I've done for you today. What are some biblical principles that you want to live by? What are some decisions you want to make ahead of time before the situation presents itself to you. I hope this was a helpful video. I hope you were blessed and I look forward to seeing you in the next video.